Uh, so I've been asked to talk about my experience on iboga of meeting Bob Marley and what happened and how that came about and how through my work with the plant spirit medicine of iboga <clears throat> and being initiated into the culture that supports uh, the the tradition of, of ingesting iboga, which is called buiti, um, how through my journey with that, I was able to um, connect very profoundly with with Bob Marley. So um, I'm going to do that. I will try to be brief in terms of um, as much as I can, but at the same time, I it's it's a little bit difficult because, um, you know, I had my full initiation in December 2019, you know, and I, during, through the course of that initiation, I was able to connect and talk to Bob Marley and Bob Marley's been dead for, I don't even remember, I, 82? I'm, I'm not even positive the year that he passed away. I can't, I can't remember now off the top of my head. I was pretty young when he died. So there's a little bit of a kind of fluidity that you have to have in your brain and, and, and please be patient with me because I'm trying to put this in a way that's linear. And one of the first things that happens when you do Bwiti and you do, um, or you do Iboga or you're initiated into Bwiti is that, you know, you, you go back and forth in lines of time very fluidly and, and you also experience so many things um, so deeply real that sometimes it's hard. I'm, I'm at the point now with my, like, um, with my work with Bwiti where sometimes I have to remind myself that, you know, that person really isn't manifest on the earth plane anymore. So I, there's certain people now that I experience because of my work with Bwiti, like I, I don't even feel this sense of separation anymore because I'm still able to have a connection with them when I do the plant medicine uh, and work with Bwiti, which is, you know, by far and away, like I know that a lot of the conversation in the West loves, loves, loves to talk about, um, you know, the miraculous ability of Iboga and Ibogaine to um, mitigate any kind of problems or relieve people who are suffering from complex addictions and and all the things that go with that, which is, that's all absolutely true. But, you know, for me, when you can go talk to somebody whose music has so profoundly influenced you and you feel like they're just sitting there with you in your living room talking to you the way your best friend <laughs> would talk to you, is extraordinary. You know, the ability to be able to talk to my mother and father who are both deceased and to really be healed from that sense of disconnection is profound. To be able to go and talk to the ancestors of Bwiti, um, for example, I'm, I'm able to connect with um, a uh, a deceased ancestor in Bwiti named Papa Andre. He's an, he was a Ngombe harp player, and he is very influential to uh, the lineage that I was initiated into. And so to, to not feel that sense of separation so totally and completely uh, is to me the most, one of the most miraculous things about Bwiti. Um, I should say also anybody that's initiated into it, it's it's very much this um, thing where you just realize that you know the horizon of your own ignorance is very vast. You know when you when you get initiated into Bwiti, you really see how much there is to learn, how much you know you've learned, but also how much more there is to learn, and so. It's incredible um, when you when you see it for the first time, when you really see the potential of it, or when you really understand 
the vastness of it. It, I would imagine it would be as if, you know, somebody grew, to me, the analogy I like to use is that, you know, somebody spent their whole life living in the mountains and grew up on a lake and then, you know, had never left that little village or town and only knew the lake. And that was their only experience of, of what water was. And then for some reason, you know, they move somewhere to a coastal city and they see the ocean for the first time. And, and that really is what I think my experience, <clears throat> excuse me, of Bwiti, of Bwiti is, is like, when you do it, you really, you really see the potential of consciousness of humanity and of the world as an ocean of wisdom and, and, and beauty and joy. So, so Bob Marley, um, my experience with Bob Marley. So when I went to do my initiation, my full initiation in December, 2019, I had already had been introduced to Iboga and Buiti 10 years prior by a very well-known <clears throat> shaman named Muganda Makala. And if you don't know who Muganda is, you should look him up and Google him. So Muganda Makala is a 10th generation Masoko shaman um, in the Buiti tradition. And he's, the best way I would describe him to somebody from the West is he's essentially the LeBron James of Buiti. He's extraordinary. Um, he's an extraordinary healer. I've seen him I've seen him heal people with multiple sclerosis in two months. You know, I've seen him just fearlessly bring people out of all sorts of illnesses and maladies. And, you know, he's very powerful, but he's also very, very, very approachable and very, you know, he has that beautiful balance of being really easy to talk to, but also you know, he's not, he's not going to let you get away with any kind of nonsense. So Mugenda was in New York working with these other shamans and I had asked them to come to a healing center that I was working at and wanted them to talk to the healing center about addiction and Iboga and Ibogaine and um, <clears throat> that was going on for a couple of weeks. <clears throat> and Mugenda was, you know, it was funny because he was, he was just dropping pearls of wisdom on me all the time, you know, throughout the whole experience. And it culminated in him asking me to come to this ceremony where he was going to be training some of his as senior students. And so um, it was at a, a house in Queens um, of my colleague, my now colleague, Michael, who uh, has also been initiated into Buiti. And so there were all these initiates there and uh, they were all dressed in their regalia, um, in their, um, you know, African, um, traditional African Bantu warrior dress. And uh, so it was, it, was, it was incredible to like walk into the room and, and I was there you know, thinking that I was just going to sort of observe and hang out and, and, and watch the ceremony, which I, you know, I love to do. Um, so, uh, through the course of the evening, it had progressed to this thing where they had all eaten Iboga, all the initiates and, and Muganda had ingested some. And so they were all sitting around the room and I, I was too scared to, do it because I was just like terrified, you know, because I was like, I just had heard these horror stories. So I was like, I'm not doing this. So finally, they, they coaxed me into taking like, like literally like an eighth of an eighth of a teaspoon, like this nominal amount. They're like, just take a little tiny bit, you know, and like literally the powder of it and just put it under your tongue. And I was like, okay, fine. So uh, I did that. And as the evening went by, um, Mugenda started quizzing all his initiates and, you know, he was kind of yelling at them. It's like, what do you see in the room? And what do you see behind me? 
and they were all like, I don't see anything, you know, and he was going around one by one and, you know, to all these men and they were like, I don't really see anything, you know. <laughs> and then he looks at me finally and he says, well, I know you can see it. And I said, excuse me? He's like, what? And he kind of yelled at me sort of like, tell me what's standing behind me right now. And I described, you know, I said, your mother and your grandfather. And, you know, it. he he laughed and he said, and it. I didn't know this at the time, but it turns out that he got his lineage from his his maternal side and he got his lineage from his mother's father and that his mother's father was a Bwiti Naganga or shaman and that um, that his mother had, they that his grandfather had given uh, Mugenda's mother um, Bwiti during when when she was pregnant with Mugenda. So so Mugenda's initiation uh into Bwiti from his grandfather came when he was uh in utero with his mother, which I thought was really an amazing story. And then there was other things that he asked me to describe and, you know, it wouldn't be right to say them, but like he's like, you know, what do you see and what do you see? What do you see? So, you know, I was like, well, this, this and this and you know, at the end of it, he was like, wow, you know, he's like, nobody's been it. Nobody's ever been able to see those things around me. And I was like, oh, okay. You know? And so all the other, uh, initiates there were like, wow, who is, what's going on here? Uh, who is this girl? You know? And I was like, I don't know. Uh, I'm not trying to do it, you know? And so Mugenda gave me this inordinate amount of information about my future in Buiti and like, my responsibilities in Bwiti and my initiation into Bwiti and I was going to go to Africa and that I was also instrumental in bringing other people to work with the medicine and blah, blah, blah. Um, which I've since, you know, which I've since discovered is all true. But at that time, 10 years ago, I was like, um, I, I was like, no, I'm too scared to do it. Got the wrong person. No way. So of course, fast forward 10 years, Pretty much everything he says comes true to the letter of the word, um, although most of it manifests definitely in ways that surprised me or that I didn't think was were would manifest the way I thought it would. So some of it was pretty intense to go through because, you know, when you're, you're put on the path of Bwiti, sometimes it's a little bit of... I would say it's like, you know, Dorothy in the yellow brick road, like you get the ruby slippers, but you still have to figure out a lot of stuff and you don't always do it succinctly. But flash forward to December, 2019 and all this, <clears throat> all these factors coalesce and I decide, okay, you know, if I'm going to do Bwiti, um, you know, my life was in a lot of, uh, a lot of turmoil had happened to me, um, in the previous summer and a lot of things that had really went like way off the rails and, and a lot of confusion and of things that, you know, I happened that I hadn't intended to happen. And no matter what I was doing, I couldn't seem to not, not only could I not fix it, I couldn't even understand what the problem was. I was so thoroughly confounded. So I went to, I decided to go to Gabon because I thought, well, if I'm going to do this, I should just go to Africa. And so really all this magical stuff transpired even towards me getting there. And then everything that laid out with the trip was very wonderful because uh, there was this sort of elegant way in which everything unfolded for me to do the trip, which was reassuring to me because uh, I, I took it all as, you know, um, like, a very good omen and I was happy about that because sometimes trying to make something happen is really arduous but everything just fell into place and so I did my full initiation into Bwiti in December um, it's a very long I don't want to yeah it's a it's an elegantly long luxurious luxuriously I don't want to say long that would be a wrong way to describe it it's a 
it's a delightfully slow, unhurried process. So you get there and, you know, when you're an American and you get, if you're lucky, five days vacation a year because, you know, we live in this insane puritanical culture that thinks like we should all work ourselves to death and God forbid anybody took a vacation and, you know, like we're all just really so pressured in in the United States to suffer so heinously, you know, to keep being the cog in the wheel. So, you know, it really messes with your head when you go to Africa because nobody's in a hurry, you know, everything in due time. And you're not in Africa, you're not working so, you, you know, you're not you're not living to work, right? You you work so you can live. But, you know, what's primary in, in Africa and Gabon is that you live your life. You know, you don't spend your life toiling over, like, you know, this kind of nonsense here in America that, you know, we're all somehow obligated to, you know, aspire to nothing except being really rich and really famous, right? You know, in America, if you aren't really rich and really famous in America, you're nobody, right? So the first thing that happens to you when you get to Africa is you get liberated from all that nonsense. And and so when I was at the village at Abando, there wasn't even really this structured like, well, we don't know what night we're going to do the initiation. And so I gave had given myself, I think, 16 days there and it ended up being like after I was there for like four or five days, even I was like to Tayo, like when, so when's this going to actually happen? Um, oh, well, how long are you here for? And I'm like, well, I'm only here on such and such day. Oh, oh, well, we better, we better move things along. And I was like, and it was, it was really, it was really funny. So I would say to anybody, if you're going to Africa, like just, you know, give yourself a month there. If you if, negotiate, <laughs> do whatever you can to negotiate for as much time as you can be there as possible if you're going to do iboga just talk to your boss and be like hey look i got to take a month of my off of my life to do this i need you to support me on this if you can if you can make that happen if you're if you're lucky enough and privileged enough to to make that happen so when i got there um the the first uh, ceremony that i had i i I just took a microdose of it because they give you microdoses if you want to take them in the first days that you get there. And so all the other initiates that I were there with, they were all taking small doses. And it was funny, they they were taking small doses and they'd go for a walk on the beach or go read or go type on the computer. So I was like, you know, and um whatever they were doing. And so I thought, well, I'll, I'll go take a microdose. So my first microdose, I think I'd been there like four days, took a microdose. The second it hit my mouth, I was like, oh, what just happened? Um, you know, I took like maybe half a spoonful of it. And by the time I got off of the porch, Tatayo has a trailer that he lives on with a porch and you go up, you go up the stairs to his porch and, and, you, you you take your dose and he puts a spoon in your mouth and gives you a little bit of water. So by the time I got off the last step of Tatayo's porch, I, I was staggering completely, totally. Like, I I was like, oh, what's happening? So I was like, all right, I, I better go to the temple because something's about to go down. And I I was zigzagging to the temple and... I sat down in the temple and one of the Nagangas, Riddhi, was like, oh, like, and he, I mean, he knew right away. And he's like, oh, 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 oh. And I was like, what's happening? And like, my heart started pounding really fast. And so in the temple in Abando, it's a dirt floor, but at the front part of the temple, there's a cement block. And at the front part, of the cement block of the temple. There's all these drums. So they're these very long, elegant, beautiful drums that are maybe, some of them are like four, five feet long. They're long and narrow. They're carved out of a single tree. So they're they're beautiful. And they, 
they were they were all up in the front against the cement block. So I walked up to the cement block in the front of the temple and like I just fell down on the cement and I I literally grabbed one of the drums <laughs> and I I I hugged it like it was like a teddy bear and you know for 6 hours I just went completely out on my first experience with Buiti. Um and that six hour journey I maybe would probably have to do a separate story on that because that's so so detailed but um you know so my first flood ceremony I guess was for me was I didn't even see it coming so um and it was wonderful because all the other Nagangas took turns sitting with me the whole time and playing the Nagombe harp and which was wonderful because I if if I hadn't had them there um, to do that, I probably would have been way more freaked out than I was. And finally, Tatayo came in, and <laughs> it was very reassuring because I just looked up at him, and I'm like, what's happening? And he said to me, he goes, oh, sweet baby. He's like, oh, no. He said, oh, boy. And he said, he said, you receive the spirit of this medicine very easily. And I said, is that what's happening? He's like, yes, you know, you're with it. And I'm like, I said, I can't even move my head or I feel like I'm going to fall over. And so um, he's like, yeah, just lie here, you know, you'll be fine. So that was my first experience. And then I guess five five days later after all these ritual um they take you into the forest and, you know, the Nagangas, which are also, the the Gangas or the Nagangas, you could also call them priests or priestesses. That's a really loaded word that I don't like to use so much because I think it that term priestess has so many different connotations associated to it. And um, But for lack of a better term, you know, uh, it, you know, they... They take you into the forest. They separate the man and the women. The women go into one side of the forest. The men go into the other, you know, and you, you do this, you bathe in this um, stream and in this river and you have these herbal baths and they pick all these plants out of the forest and, and you know, they bring them back from your initiation into the forest and they create a spiritual bath bucket for you. That takes a whole day and then you get repeatedly over and over and over again you get washed and bathed for like five or six days you have a smoke bath and you have um I, I the, think the day before your ceremony you have this tea that they they these herbs that they boil for you and they give it to you as a tea they give you like a couple of cups of it and they have you sit in the temple and drink it and so it's a it's liver cleansing and it's also um, depending on the the different person's reaction to it. Like I, th- I they use it as some sort of barometer. I think to to figure out you know how much uh, medicine you might need to give the person. So there's all sorts of analysis that's going on. And some people that drink the tea um, throw up right away. Some people don't throw up at all. Or it's it's just different for every person. Um, but if you see there's a lot of videos on the internet and if you see somebody drinking that tea and purging um it is almost cartoon like um because it it's so funny like it it tastes fine it doesn't even really taste like anything so it's pretty funny how radically involuntary the 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 part is that you know um when you throw up it just comes exploding out of you but it's it's weird because you don't even feel it coming on like you would if you were nauseous or something so we did that part I think I drank like three or four jars of the tea and I um I I only like maybe spit up like a little tiny bit of it and whereas other initiates you know had a more like Everybody had a different reaction to it. It was, it was, that was interesting too. So there's a lot of different levels of it. And um, so the night of my initiatory ceremony, you know, 
they only gave me three spoons because they're like, you know, you're, you're so sensitive to this. Like we probably are not going to need to give you more than that. And the other initiates, you know, the 11, 12, 15, I think one had 20. Uh, and I, you know, some people have had, you know, to take up to 30. So that's one of the things that's just, a. a it's very hard to gauge until you're there, like how much you will need or you will not need. But I'm just bringing that up because, you know, the the consciousness of Bwiti, uh, it knows what you need. So it really sets the priority of those kind of things. So that's one of the reasons why I think it's, um, I would caution anybody against doing it against getting iboga off the internet and doing it themselves because there's all these preparatory things that need to happen and also it's very hard to figure out if you don't already have initiation into the medicine what's the proper amount to give yourself um you know because if you give yourself too much and your body rejects it um then it doesn't really spend enough time in your 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 physical body to like do the thing that you want it to do so um, I would I would go on record as saying I don't think anybody should do it by themselves you know I don't know maybe unless you're at the North Pole and you know or whatever I mean I know there's exceptions to everything but I, I would really discourage anybody from you know, just getting some off the internet and taking it themselves. Um, and, th- you know, that's where the Bob Marley thing comes in because the other thing that is becomes radically obvious to you, or at least to me, was that the, the, the thing that was holding my ceremony together was the harp player, was Bokaye. So, um, and I did find out later from doing all this research and talking to other gangas and people that have been initiated and have a lot of experience with the culture that they're like absolutely like music is fundamental to really having uh, an initiation into Bwiti and the crux of everything that holds together a Bwiti ceremony is a Nagombe harp player so in the west you know, it's usually the drummer, right? So the drummer holds the whole band together. And, you know, there's that saying that a band is only as good as its drummer. And, you know, the responsibility of a drummer is to really keep the whole, you know, performance moving along. And um, so, but you don't use drums in, in Bwiti, partly because you're, you're you are you're so sensitive to sound and so um drumming is very intense when you're on buiti and so the sound of a harp like the nagombe harp is um you know it's it's just practically perfect it's like you you get you get it's hard to describe again if you haven't done it but you're so quickly realize wow like the harp is this is the most perfect instrument for this path so the Nagombe harp player Bukaye is you know I'm like oh okay gotcha like he's running the whole show like he's holding everything together he's weaving everything together and the Nagombe harp player also uh, you know they're they're speaking out a new they're 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 praying out a new vision for your future. So they're speaking out with their words and they're creating this fabric, like they're weaving this fabric of reality of your life now. So they're singing songs that are like radically, radically, radically beautiful poetic affirmations. And each word is used very, very thoughtfully and very carefully. And there's no redundancy or there's there's really no wasted kind of fluffy stuff in, in uh, 
in a Buiti ceremony, especially with the music, um, because that music is reprogramming, reprogramming your consciousness. So my journey was that 40 hours. So we started at 10 o'clock at night. Um, I, the, for me, the intense visions lasted probably six or seven hours. Uh, there was a couple of points there where it was so intense. I was like, I, it was just coming. It was f so much so fast over and over and over again that I, I, you know, I, I thought if it got any faster, I kind of felt like I was going to lose it a little bit. So, but after like six or eight hours, then it slows down a little bit. And, and then after another three or four hours, it slows down a little bit more and a little bit more. But I want to say that I, I don't think I even left the temple and went back to my room till noon the next day, uh, where most other people, I think like by four or five in the morning, they had just gotten up and walked themselves back to their room. But um, I, I'd had, I, it was, you know, ironic. I'd had like the smallest dose, but I also, I think of the initiates I was there with, I think I probably had the most intense visions and not that it's a contest, but just to say that um, a lot of people get really hung up on what's the right dose to take. And it's like, well, it's just different for every person. So, um, so I was there till noon the next day and then had finally was able to go back to my room and then had really strong visions until noon the following day. So much so that you do get to a point, I think everybody gets to a point when they're new to Buiti where you're like, oh my God, when is this going to stop? Like you do get to this place where you're kind of like, all right, I just want to go back to kind of my ordinary mind. And so in in the visions, um, I'd say 98% of my visions were personal and about people that were really specifically personal to my life. And um, it was very, very personal. So 98% of uh, my stuff wouldn't it wouldn't be appropriate to share. Um, but there was this also this, this vision that kept coming up of myself standing next to, I would, I would, as part of those visions of my full initiation, I would go to this, what I understood to be the bottomless pit. So, um, so the bottomless pit is actually it's a it's a biblical reference and it's also where the concept of the abyss comes but in context of Bob Marley's song Redemption Song um you know most people consider it a reference to the holding castles so on the west coast of Africa um when when slavery arose um as an institution, whatever it is, 450 years ago, 500 years ago. Um, uh, one of the ways that they enforced um, the institution of slavery is that they created these, these, they called them holding castles, but they were really holding cells. And so they would, um, they would exist in different places in the West Coast of Africa. And one of them was Libreville, Gabon. And so, <clears throat> A lot of times, um, you know, they would just they would just um, round up um, men and women that they were going to enslave uh, from different parts of Africa, and they would bring them to these uh, coastal countries and throw them all together into uh, these holding castles, and so. Um, in this, and it's sometimes it's sometimes referred to as the bottomless pit, and um, so in Redemption Song it's, it says, "Old pirates, yes they rob I, sold I to the merchant ship, minutes after they took I from the bottomless pit." So, um, in that song, uh, 
you know, which is so visual in its in its depiction. It's like, you know, I, I don't I can't imagine anybody listening to that song and not having such a clear visual image. And so when I heard that song when I was a kid, I I just immediately envisioned like all these people in this giant circular pit in the ground that they couldn't get out of. So in my Buiti vision, I got taken back to this vision that I had as a child the first time I heard Redemption Song. And I was standing there on the side of the quote unquote pit. And, you know, the vision would come and go and I would go, uh, you know, in my Buiti vision, I would hop around between all these timelines and I would, I would have these memories of it would jump me around to like memories of things that had happened to me a year ago and 10 years ago and 20 years ago. And, and, and they were so vivid and so real. And then I would come back to this standing on the side of this pit and then they'd take me away from it again. And so it was like this sort of staccato crazy thing where I would hop, 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 like almost like mm, flipping through different, um, chapters in a book and you're just going back and forth or however you want to envision it so um I would come back to the pit and then I'd get pulled away from it and come back to it and and the every successive time that I came back to standing on the precipice of this pit um I I was able to look into the pit and and start to make out six faces so I I would start to see people in the bottomless pit and I would start to realize that they were in my vision they were all they were all men and they were all musicians um, or artists that I had known when I worked in the music industry so um, the vast majority of my um, 20s and half of my 30s I spent working in the music industry predominantly in um alternative music and and really hip hop and so the the genres that I'm really aligned with are like soul R&B funk hip hop reggae like that's my whole orientation towards music and I had at the time I had worked at Sony, I'd worked at Capitol, I'd worked at A and M Records, I'd worked at Virgin Records America, um, you know, back when these were all record labels and you know the the record business was thriving and people were making lots of money and you know depending on the artist, you know, um, you know some of them were making money, some of them had also had you know, record deals, like uh, probably the most infamous one is Tribe Called Quest. But some of them had, had um, you know, record De La Soul, like a lot of people that I grew up with had these record deals that were structured in a way where they signed these contracts and basically were enslaved, um, you know, and that was like a big part of Prince's whole rebellion against Warner Brothers, which is like, that's a, you know, 20 chapter book in the history of music but so I I was very conversant with all these issues of like what happens to people once they get into the music industry and just the struggle that artists in general go through with their record labels and then it all gets magnified when you're talking you know to people of color so um you know so I would stand there on the precipice in my Buiti vision of the bottomless pit and I would would start to make out faces of artists that I knew and it would just it would just become clearer and clearer and clearer and then Buiti would pull me away from the bottomless pit and I would go back into all these other visions uh, of my life of other people and they were I think helping me thread together the connectivity of certain events in my life, which is a very common theme with anybody that does um, Buiti or Iboga. They're, they'll thread things together for you very fluidly. So you start to see like how everything happens for a reason, how everything connects, how this led to this and that led to that. And that's why that happened. Um, if you've ever seen the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, you will, you should, you should definitely see it because 
so much of what happens when you take Buiti is very, very much like that movie. Um, it's a Frank Capra movie. It stars Jimmy Stewart. Uh, he questions everything about his life and then wakes up and has to like revisit his life as if he wasn't there. And this is like, and starts to see all these connections that he was part of that created all these other realities and created the, you know, how he influenced all these other people in ways that he didn't realize. So, so this is the same thing with Buiti. Buiti will show you that so radically that, um, it's just, it'll, it will blow your mind when you, when you're trying to thread together why things happen the way they do. And it'll give you this real sense of reassurance and ease. And, and I, I think that's one of the most amazing ways it helps you. If you, if you're a person that is really filled with regret, like we T will show you really quickly, like everything in your life that plays out does so for a reason. And so I was getting reassurance as the process went on of like going back and forth in all these timelines. Um, but I was really disconcerted about the bottomless pit because what was coming into my reality more and more and more was that, you know, these were all people who were very important in my life. These were all artists that I loved really dearly um, and were, you know, extraordinary men and extraordinary I don't know why you know I don't know why there were no women in my bottomless pit I there just weren't it's not that I don't have the same thoughts about female artists it's just this was just the way it was in my vision so I don't know mm, the way this played out Pro may maybe because a lot of what I did was a lot of my time I think I I worked in hip-hop and hip-hop's completely totally you know it's the ultimate bromance, <laughs> the ultimate, the ultimate African American male bromance is hip hop, in my opinion. So, I am, um, you know, kept seeing people, and then there were certain, there were certain people that, you know, there was certain people, one in particular I could see, and then I also, I also understood, you know, that like there's certain people that were very that very close to me and then um I had this recognition in the bottomless pit as well that like you know just that this energy was also carrying over into you know a lot of their lives now with their struggles with just you know trying to get compensated for their art and uh and and then it what came into the foray in, in one of the visions later on was that as the Buiti ceremony progressed was that I was standing in the bottomless pit and there was, um, I could feel that there was a, a baby strapped upon my back and it was a boy and I was in the traditional African garb and I could see myself that I, you know, I was this person that I was in a past life and, I got also really clear that I had witnessed um I had witnessed the slave trade and all the horrors and I don't want to talk about what I saw because there was parts of it that were so horrible that I would just traumatize people but then there was a big part of it and that was probably the hardest part where I had to watch that and and relive it and I at certain points I would just I'd have to look away from it and I would I would beg uh Buiti I'd just be like please don't I don't I know what you're going to show me like please don't I don't want to see it again and and what I understood at that point was that they were saying like well we just want you to know you were here so this isn't just that you have read about this in books and you have a memory of it like in this you you've had lifetimes where you witnessed this horrific holocaust and I was like okay and <clears throat> so towards the culmination of like that ceremony um it, that's where we that that's where I left it and you know then the other visions that carried me through that ceremony in Africa for my full initiation I mean they were just so beautiful so extraordinarily beautiful and so then uh, I started to also have this realization like, wow, I don't, 
you know, I don't know why everybody says that. I don't know why so many people's narrative about Buiti is that it's hard and scary because I thought it was the most beautiful, magical thing that I that I ever had happen. To, to certain points where I was just like, I don't even want to, like, I, like, I don't even want to come back to <laughs> planet Earth if this is how awesome how awesome it is. So, you know, I was actually trying not to get attached to it because my experience of it was like, I was getting really attached to it. Like, wow, this is amazing. It's like so beautiful. Um, and, uh, so, you know, since that, since that initial ceremony, I had done like 15 successive ceremonies and they, they all play off that initial ceremony, but the, you know, it's quite frequent that like I come back to this bottomless pit um, and this, this, this recurring theme of the bottomless pit would show up over and over and over again. And so maybe I would say it was February of 2020. I was doing a ceremony and was at the bottomless pit again. And I was listening to, um, music on my iPod that was Buiti music and my iPod just randomly put on uh, a Bob Marley song it wasn't redemption song it was maybe it was three little birds and I was like that's weird why did my iPod just suddenly do that and so I was standing at the pit my iPod sort of magically plays um, three little birds and all of a sudden I feel this presence standing next to me and it's, I look and it's like I'm at the edge of the pit and I look to my right and it's uh, Bob Marley standing next to me. And I, it was so real that it was so, it was so real. He was so real. <laughs> I don't know if you've done Buiti or Iboga, you totally get what I'm saying when I say he was so real. And if you haven't done it, you wouldn't have no idea what I mean when I say it was so real, but it was so real that I completely, totally understood that I was talking to him and that he hadn't gone anywhere. He had just transitioned into a different dimension. And, um, I looked at him and I felt this feeling wash over me. And then he touched me on my left shoulder with his fingertip and he smiled. And I instantly in this Buiti vision got transported back to uh, this. I had done this job for a benefit concert for Tibet. And it was around 2000, 1999, 2000, I'm not even sure the year, but his son Ziggy was one of the performers. And so it was like Lou Reed, maybe I think Rufus Wainwright, it was a Tibet House concert at Carnegie Hall. And the people at Tibet House asked me to backstage manage the event. So I was like, okay, which is basically just, you're a glorified babysitter for the artist. You know, it's like, you know, you, you make sure their pillows are fluffed and like you give them a hug and... Like, you know, you order them coffee if they want it or whatever and hand it to them and they, they thank you. So it's a, it's a pretty fun job. And so I remember that I had to escort Ziggy and his family and his musicians to their green room. And it was it was really funny because most of the artists, I think Lou Reed came in with his wife, Lori Anderson, you know, and... Uh, he went to his green room. He had a couple of friends and Angelique Kiddo and like whoever, they all had their own green rooms and maybe three or four people in it. But, but I remember when I'll never forget when Ziggy Marley came in through the back door of Carnegie Hall. I, I want to say there was like 25 people. It was awesome. It was like the entire Marley tribe and it's all its affiliated peoples. Like they come rolling up through the, the, into the green room and so I escort them to their green room and um, it was awesome. Like it was, you walk into the room and it was just, it was just filled with people. So uh, it was, you could, you could barely walk through the room. And for some reason they, Ziggy asked me for something. And so I went in there to, I don't know what, it was something, probably something to eat or something. And I, 
so I filtered back out of the room and I stopped and I, I turned to look back at all the people standing in the room, which were, you know, probably half of them were all related to Bob directly. And I saw this shadow move across the green room. And I was like, ooh, like, that's weird. Like, what the heck was that? And then I'd heard these rumors that, like, Con Carnegie Hall was really haunted. So I thought, oh, maybe there's, like, Carnegie Hall ghost that's hanging out with the Marley family. And then I went to open the door of the green room to leave, and I felt this energy push me back. And I felt that, I felt this energy, like, go through me. And I was like, whoa, what was that? I was like, okay, that's really weird. All right, Carnegie Hall's haunted. Okay, no problem. Closed the door, ran down the stairs, went back to, like, the staging area, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so, uh, you know, flash forward to this moment on Buiti when I'm, you know, February 2020, and I'm looking at Bob Marley, and he's just touched his finger to my shoulder. And... I was like, oh my God, that was you. And he said, yeah, that was me. And, you know, there's another backstory to this that you can Google, but Bob Marley had gone to Gabon. Um, you know, and a lot of people that uh, do Bwiti think it's really highly probable that he probably did a Bwiti ceremony. Um, I don't know if there's any evidence to support that or not, but um, my sense is just from my experience with Buiti, that that's probably true. So we were standing on the precipice of the bottomless pit and he's talking to me and I said, you know, so this is where, this is where you got the idea for the song. And he's like, he said, yes. And he said, do you understand how it also carries over into the music industry? And do you understand how it carries over into your life? And do you understand what Marcus Garvey was talking about? And so, um, you know, I had gotten my undergrad degree in African American studies, and uh, the line "Emancipate yourself from mental slavery; none but ourselves can free our mind." That's a line taken from a speech that Marcus Garvey gave. Oh, I, I'm not off. I'm not positive. I want to say it was in the 1930s. Um, I know it was in Nova Scotia at St. Philip's African Church, and so he had given this speech about you know, that really, if you don't free yourself mentally from the things that enslave you, it doesn't matter if you are, quote unquote, living in a free and open society. And uh, for those that don't know, Marcus Garvey really was the, he, he's Jamaican, he created, um, the concept of Pan-Africanism, the Pan-African flag, which is the horizontal red, green, and black flag. That's the brainchild of Marcus Garvey. The black represents the African diaspora peoples. The red represents the blood that they shed, you know, being sold into the institution of slavery and being dispersed all over the world um, through the institution of slavery. And the green is the homage to Africa or the motherland and to the forest and so, you know, everything that Marcus Garvey did was super deep. And so, you know, Bob had sort of, Bob had fused, you know, the way I saw it, like Bob had fused his consciousness into this collective consciousness that Marcus Garvey had plugged into. And so, you know, in my Buiti ceremony, I, I saw this and then I, you know, and, and then I started to see you know, I started to see the toils of the men that I've known in the music industry who, um, you know, because of the stress of the music industry, they've gotten really sick or they've died. And I started to see all this analogy on the, the precipice or the edge of the bottomless pit standing next to Bob. And I started crying. And in one scene, I saw one of the men that I knew in this life. And I saw this, you know, it's metaphorical depiction of um, somebody that was enslaving them and like um, he had been pulled out of the pit and he was being um, uh, whipped and he was being, you know, basically um, he got 
uh, whipped to death. And it was, it was really horrific. And, and I, in that particular moment, I, um, I also, you know, I, I could see myself with the, the, the baby strapped on my back and I was standing there and watching it and I was helpless. And I think I merged with the collective pain of all women who've had to watch, you know, their sons or their husbands or the men in this world um, kill each other, you know, like, you know, I merged with the collective pain of all women who are, you know, wonder like, how, how has it come to pass in this world that like the only way that we give and support men and give men accolades is by asking ourselves like, well, which one of these can be the more vicious killer? You know, Who, whoever of these two men can be the more vicious, heinous, hideous, you know, um, destroyer and killer. Like, you know, that's, that's who we celebrate, you know, and the pain of it was so overwhelming to me that I like felt my heart explode in this Bwiti ceremony. And then I turned and I walked with the, with the baby in my vision and I walked into this uh, desert plain and I, I consciously walked into the desert plain and the sun was beating down on me so hard that I, I, I dehydrated and, you know, I basically, I, I basically took my own life and my son's life and, um, I disintegrated. Like I, I, I merged with the dust of the land. Like I fell down on the ground and then the sun continued to like disintegrate me and the baby on my back. And then in the vision, I merged with the, the dust of the land of Africa and and so then you know I in in this vision of this then my physical body that was experiencing this in in uh, in 2020 um I I probably cried for two or three hours and then that passed and then in like three or four more successive ceremonies after the pain and the trauma of that past, I could stand on the precipice of the pit again and Bob would come back in the successive ceremonies and he would talk to me again and we'd talk about what we saw in the pit and you know and I, I you know over this you know really long arc of this story that you know is you know 20 30 hours <laughs> of visions on Bwiti and you've done it now 11 or 12 times, right? So that's, I don't even know, 300 hours or something like that. I don't, I don't even, can't even think of it as I'm talking, but, um, you know, finally Bob looks at me and he says, um, I said, I just don't know what to do. And he said, he said, jump down there in the pit and get them out. And I'm like, okay. So that is pretty much the, point that I started to understand that you know my interest or, or my inspiration in 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 Bwiti and with Iboga is really it does have so much to do with um, musicians and and really very I mean tangible practical things of like just promoting health and wellness and mental health and and uh, amongst musicians and to support them and to you know in as much as I can connect as many musicians as I can with plant medicine if they choose to do it because you know you know everybody is carrying ancestral wounds you know and everybody <laughs> everybody on the planet's carrying ancestral wounds and um I think from my own personal experience, like what Bwiti would like me to focus on is people that are um, from the industry that I, you know, honed a lot of my skills in, which is, which is music and musicians. And so that is really the arc of like my, 
the the directive and like that's my passion and it, and I think that's where my work is personally. I know that a lot of people like BT will put you I think into different directions like you know I mean there's people that are passionate advocates of um using it to heal addiction and that's one thing but um you know Buiti is so powerful and so multidimensional and it will it will it will guide you I, I you know the other thing is also you know my my undergrad degree was in African American studies my master's is in social work I'm I'm very inspired, um, you know, and I'm going on, you know, Buiti was like, well, you're getting your PhD. And I'm like, oh, okay, I thought I was just going to get my master's. They're like, no, you're going to get your PhD. And they gave me this whole, you know, track of like everything to do. But, you know, m- my interest always has also been in um, promoting this reconnectivity to, to, ancestral lineages and to indigenous culture and to to really you know decolonizing you know decolonizing your mind you know if you've had the privilege and to be from an indigenous culture from anywhere else in the world that you know you're coming to the United States is you know there's a lot of trade-offs you make for living in a country where you know you have giant cars and washing machines and, you know, all this technology, um, you know, and, and, you know, a lot of times the trade-off is that you lose this connection to what it just means to be not in a society where everything's transactional, right? Where, you know, where you're just a utensil to somebody else and where you're not an object and, and, you know, the quintessence I think of African culture is that, you know, everybody in the village is is seen as an intrinsic necessary member of the village and that every person in a village is there because spirit sent them there. Um, there's nobody that's a problem. There's nobody that is the ostracized, shunned outsider. And if somebody is playing that role, the elders and the wisdom keepers of the village in Africa understand that 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 child is a projection of something that is amiss in the collective of the village, right? They don't they don't they don't see it as like oh, you know this person's the other, so we have to send them off to jail or whatever. We have to exile them, you know. They're like we have to integrate whatever role that that person is playing in our shadow we have to we have to see that as an expression of something that needs to be healed within the collective of the village so that's like quintessence of most indigenous cultures african ireland like you know you know um most of my ancestry is irish a little bit of it's african but it's predominantly irish but it's the same thing it's like you know indigenous people we got colonized by the british and so buiti very much is very much concerned also with, in in my experience with me, you know, and they've said it to me, it's like, we're going to decolonize your mind completely. And I'm like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> but, um, and I think that brings me to my final part is that I feel that my work also above and beyond anything is about giving back to Africa, about going to Africa, about the importance of journeying. If you are in a relationship with this medicine, Buiti, like, and you have the means to go to Africa, you, you should, you should give yourself the gift of, of going there, um, to not be afraid of it, you know, to not, to not dismiss it, um, and to resist this urge of wanting, you know, Iboga or Ibogaine or Buiti, resisting this urge of wanting it to be delivered to you in a way that, that is basically turns it into this thing of like, you're going through the drive through at Starbucks. Like this is the thing that really personally drives me crazy about this obsession with trying to turn it into this, you know, thing where you just take it one night so you can get normal again and you can go back to whatever. Like that is something that really frustrates me about, you know, I feel like in a lot of instances, some people just sort of think it's like this fast food 
restaurant you're at, you know, and you're like, uh, no. So my advocacy, I think, primarily beyond even music and musicians in the music business is the preservation of the rainforest. Um, you know, there's tremendous poaching of elephants and the people that poach elephants also poach iboga. They're decimating it in the forest. Um, and, and so I, my, my real passion, I think in my, my life above and beyond anything is just really to, to, maintain that understanding and that connectivity that like every single one of us came from a village it's in our dna we all came from these small villages and we all came you know originally we everybody's you know we all came from africa you you track your lineage back far enough right we all we all Afri- african Africa is the origins of civilization. Um, so that's really my passion and life's work with Buiti. And I think that as I've successively worked through this kind of concept of what the bottomless pit is, my understanding is also that Buiti moves you past that. It moves you past that collective wound of the bottomless pit and moves you deeper into this connectivity with the, you know, the, the garden of Eden is what a lot of people call it. But just, I think it's this profound understanding that, um, there is this other world that you can reaccess to, and you can have it right now. And you can, you can really emancipate yourself from your own mental constructs and your own mental slavery and um, that to me is pretty exciting and uh, that's what I'm about so if you've made it to minute 107 um, thank you for taking the time to listen Um, yeah and um, uh, I will link in the I will put the link to a bando village in the 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 bio. Um thank you for listening.
want to be with her. This song I play now. Yeah.